here today because I was here almost two years ago today becoming completely immersed in the political teachings of Yvette Carnell and Antonio Moore, introduced to me by the Honorable Dr. Kevin Cosby. At the 2019 conference, we were instructed, we, we, we had a call to action about Project Takeover, taking over institutions, institutions that were supposed to serve us. So the institution I decided to take over was City Council. Because they're supposed to serve us. And since being on City Council, I've gained so much experience that I'm blessed to share with you today. My political toolbox, because we talk so much about building and we don't always know what we need to build. In late October of 1967, Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. spoke at a middle school in Philadelphia. That speech became known as, what is your life's blueprint? By a show of hands, how many of you have heard that speech? Just curious, okay. So in that speech, you might have heard that he talked about when building something, you need an architect who draws a blueprint a pattern, a guide, a model for that building. He uplifted nonviolence, direct action, by saying instead of singing burn, baby, burn, we should be singing build, baby, build. Organize, baby, organize. Learn, baby, learn, so that we can earn, baby, earn. King motivated these young people to believe in themselves. But we adults, we grown. We wouldn't be here if we weren't already somewhat motivated and you believe in the ADOS Advocacy Foundation blueprint, right? So instead of asking, what is your life's blueprint? For the next, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, I wanna ask you a different question. And that question is, what's in your political toolbox to build what's on that blueprint? I keep at least 10 tools myself. And if you're familiar with Dr. King's six steps to nonviolent direct action, you'll notice some of them are the same, but I'm on the inside, so I've kind of remixed it, if you will. I've modernized these steps. My political tools can be used in any order. You can even skip some, but it's important to know that all of them work together. We have been tricked and to thinking the only political tool that we have is your vote. That is not only unjust, untrue, unproductive, it's also unserious if we want this thing called change. We have way too much work to do for you to vote and then clock out. So when I'm working on writing laws or writing laws, because some of them were written to wrong us. These are my 10 go-to political tools. Everyone say education. education. Learn everything you can about the problem. Learn everything you can about the person or persons with the power to solve the problem. Learn everything you can about the process to address the problem. Learn everything you can before you proceed with the rest of the tools. But keep in mind, education, learning, is omnipresent. It's everywhere. You'll constantly be learning throughout anything that you're doing. And when I say education, I don't necessarily mean a formal education. I don't mean a, a high school diploma. I don't even mean a college degree. But if you go to college and you're in this city, you gotta go to Simmons. But I mean learning whatever, whenever, wherever, however. I know two little black girls, ages 10 and 12 years old, who learned the hard way that they could be discriminated against because of their natural hair. They cared so much about changing that fact that they learned about something called the Crown Act that bans discrimination against natural hair. They made a song about it, a music video. 
They taught me about the Brown Act. They performed it for me, and they said, Jacory, Councilman Arthur, will you pass this locally? I wrote it the next day. I filed it the next week. And less than a month later, we passed it unanimously. Those Those little girls, 10 and 12 years old, in this city, used political education to pass legislation. Even beyond legislation, educating yourself about simple things is important for the overall process. Like when your city's fiscal year starts. Over half of American cities have fiscal years that start July 1st. What are y'all doing in May and June to make sure that city budget goes to Adolph's communities? Do you know who appropriates and approves the city budget in your city? Do you know that earlier this spring, something passed called the American Rescue Plan Act that will send $350 billion to states, territorial governments, tribal governments, local governments, to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, which we all know has impacted us more than anyone else? Did you know that Louisville got 388 million? How much did your city get? Who's the chairperson of your city's budget committee? Who's making decisions about that money, where it's being spent, who it's going to? King called this information gathering and described it as being able to identify the issues in your community in need of positive change, to understand the issue, problem, or injustice facing a person, community, or institution, you must increase your understanding of the problem. Your investigation should include all sides of the issue and may include formal research and listening to experiences of others. Y'all doing that today. We have to be in the know. What's special about this movement is that we constantly use political education. We know plenty of data. We know it's vital to our work because without data, you can't track progress. But if that data, that education, just sits, it's useless. Which brings us to political tool number two that I love to use. Everyone say, communication. communication. Tell the people around you about the problem. And when you tell them, tell them with the purpose of lighting them on fire. And what I mean by that is, in the 2019 ADOS conference, it inspired me, but more than anything, it fired me. You should make someone so hot when you talk about our disparities and our reality in this country that you mobilize them. But don't stop there because mobilizing is not the same thing as organizing. When you mobilize, you bring people to the fight. When you organize, you teach them how to fight. Then you hop in that ring and go Muhammad Ali. This political tool is important for recruitment because you use it to identify other people who are impacted by the problem or allies like Brother Paul Sowers over here, who care about the problem. And when you use this tool, use it with the people that are closest to you. Because how can you communicate with your city council if you can't communicate with the people you go to church with? How can you communicate with your mayor if you can't communicate with the kids in your own house? How can you communicate with your elected representative when you won't even communicate with your spouse? How can you communicate with Congress if you can't even communicate with your neighborhood? This tool can help you build your base, which helps you build strength. Because the more people you have, the more power you have, which is why tool number three is essential. Everyone say collaboration. collaboration. Work with other people or groups on the solution to your problem. In Louisville, we passed a resolution that I helped create that made homelessness and affordable housing the number one priority for our American Rescue Plan dollars. And when I say we, I mean myself, Legislative Brianna Wright, who's in our office, who's in here today. I mean the Coalition for the Homeless and their followers. A long list 
a long list of people who cared enough about that issue. I just told you earlier, eight in 10 of the people sleeping outside are ADOS. That's the number one issue in my district. If you don't have a house, you don't have anything. So we made that the top issue because we collaborated with other institutions to push for that. Now, ADOS as an organization will struggle with collaboration because it ain't too many folks talking about reparations. And if they are, they're doing it all wrong. So a lot of our collaboration will be internal. The people in this room, you on this stream, the people back in your households, your neighbors, the people closest to you, but no matter the issue, when you're finally ready to take that work to others, whether it's organization to organization, person to person, you have to follow it up with an important tool that we miss. Everyone say delegation. delegation. Spread the work around. When we don't delegate our politics, we don't maximize our potential. That would be like a basketball team with nothing but centers. I can't imagine five shacks on that court. That would be like the Simmons marching band only putting crash symbols on the field. That would be like a march, which I saw plenty last year, where everybody has a megaphone. <laughs> you delegate to maximize efficiency, which can lead to maximizing effectiveness. You want to get that outcome. And make sure you're assigning the work to the people who know what they're doing. Some people can design graphics. Some people can't. Some people can speak publicly. Some people shouldn't. Some people can create a meeting agenda, and some people should just attend the meeting for moral support. Whatever the task is, be honest with yourself that you're putting the proper people in place to accomplish your goals. King said this was a personal commitment. You have to check and affirm your faith in the philosophy and the methods of nonviolence because causing change requires dedication and long hours. Shout out to the teams who put in hours every single day of the week when we have our meetings on Zoom. Because King also says you have to meet regularly to stay focused on your goal. Prepare yourself to accept sacrifices if necessary in your work for justice. And if you're in a place to push that work forward, you have to take all of these steps to the next level, which I didn't realize it was a word until like the other week, but everyone say, advocation. advocation. You have to campaign your solution for the problem. See, communication was just about telling someone something, telling them about the problem, someone close to you, recruiting, seeing who cared about it. Advocation or advocacy is targeting the messaging telling everybody about the problem, and more importantly, telling everyone about the solution. I've spent most of my career advocating in music and advocating in education. Some of us advocate on social media. Some of us also do it through knocking on doors, neighborhood canvassing, contacting your elected officials. There are all sorts of ways to advocate, but as we know, sometimes that's not enough. So we gotta pull out tool number six, which is Everyone say agitation. agitation. Pressure decision makers to act on the solution. Dr. King did this a lot and he called it direct action. Actions taken to convince others to work with you in resolving the injustice, also known as creative tension. And it's most effective when it illustrates the injustice it seeks to correct. See, if a random person was watching TV and wondering Last year, why are black people protesting in the streets? Why do they keep putting themselves in harm way with the police? We wanted to show you how the police treated us in real time. There are hundreds of direct actions, boycotts, marches, rallies, down ballot voting, which we have used, sit-ins, walkouts, so many ways to act. This is what our people do oh so well. But the mistake some of us make is that we use direct action as a tool without using other tools. If you're going to march in the street, you better have a message. If you're going to camp on the mayor's lawn, you better have a demand. 
Otherwise, as I said about information, it's just sitting there and it's just useless. I would argue that agitation or direct action is one of your biggest weapons. It's your flamethrower. Because as Dr. Cosby has said in the past, politicians don't change because they see the light, they change because they feel the heat. And if you turn on that oven, you better be ready to cook. And if that all works, we get to political tool number seven, which I like, because I like arguing in the, in the council chamber, but political tool number seven, everyone say negotiation. You work with elected leaders, you work with the power structure on solving that problem. In Louisville, we have $10 million in the city budget every year for something called the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And none, zero percent of that money went to families at 30% area median income, which is the lowest level of income. One person making about 15,000 or less. None of the money went to them. None of the money went to building housing that they could afford. So this year, we pushed on it, we advocated, and we said you need to earmark some of that money for those families, which are the majority of ADOS. We were told no. So we had to agitate a little bit. And that got us to the table to negotiate. We had to advocate, agitate, to get to the table to negotiate. And we were able to get 25%. Now, keep in mind, the trust fund was created in 2008 when I was a junior in high school. And since then, they have never ever built housing specifically for the families who are at the very bottom, who when you look at the housing needs assessment account for over half of the missing units of housing in this city. So next year we're going for more than 25 because we need 54%, but even after negotiating that in the budget, we have to go back and change the ordinance which leads us to political tool number eight, which is my job. Everyone say legislation. legislation. Making solutions permanent through law. But before we get into that, please never leave that totally in the hands of the so-called policy makers. Why? Because I believe everyone is a policy maker. I'm just a policy passer. I'm a councilman. You might have a representative, a senator. They just pass the policy. That's their power. That's their responsibility. But we fail to realize how much power is really in our hands as constituents. Again, the more people you have, the more power you have. Politicians are only in office because you put them there. And everything they do is because you tolerate it. So... Sometimes I think it's kind of comical how we got all this smoke for politicians who aren't doing right by their people, but no smoke for the people who aren't doing right by their people by continuously voting these people in office. And I, I'll just give you a quick example. I'm just complaining about my job. Uh, <laughs> in Louisville, there are 26 Metro Council members. 26. Only 26 people in the whole city of 800,000 plus can pass laws. I'm one of them. But in each council district, there are over 26,000 constituents. It's one of me. It's 26,000 of y'all. It's one of me. It's 26,000 of y'all. So sometimes when I get asked questions about what we're working on, what we're doing, People don't realize, going back to what I said about the vote, don't just clock out and walk off. I need you to mobilize and organize so that we can pass policy. I need you to be there with me so that we can put that earmarking in the budget to get what we need. I need you to stand up for your local HBCU who helped develop everything that we barely have in the city of Louisville because they're responsible for the black middle class anyway. I need you. We can't do anything alone. Because if I go to one of my colleagues, because we gotta get 14 votes to pass something, if I go to one of my colleagues, it's a lot easier to convince them. It's a lot easier to convince them if a thousand people in their district agree with me. 
because you have the power to put them in office and you also have the power to take them out of office. Your vote is a tool. But for some reason, we think tools are only meant to build something, put something together. When you vote a politician in office, you put them together. Don't ever forget, you can use that same tool to take them apart. And when you vote, don't ever forget that a legislator's job is to legislate. And I'll say what I said again earlier, as a black legislator, my job is to legislate, write the laws, but also write as in correct the laws because some of them were written to wrong us. But a legislator's job is to legislate. Before I was born, one of our state representatives got in trouble because when he was campaigning, he was handing out fried chicken at the polls. I just learned that like a month ago and it made sense because when we campaigned, I was blown away with how many Negroes expected pizza parties. <laughs> Politics is an, is an exchange, it's not a gift, but I didn't think we were exchanging pizza. I thought we were exchanging policy. During the campaign, you know, we were checking analytics and searches, and the top three searches for me during the campaign were Ja'Cory Arthur's wife, Ja'Cory Arthur's age, and Ja'Cory Arthur, what is Ados? For the record, I'm not married yet. I'm 29 right now, and I was 28 during the majority of the campaign. I'm the youngest elected official in city history, and I am unapologetically Ados. this organization is crucial. Yes. We do actual politics. I'm probably not going to be in office next year because people call our office and I say no to all sorts, including ribbon cuttings, honorary street signs, holidays. I'm doing legislation. And this political tool, legislation, has the power to have long-lasting impact because when you change the laws, you change the rules. And in a country where we have been losing for centuries, wouldn't it be nice to have some rules in our favor? Come on. But even after you pass that legislation, another political tool you have to keep in that toolbox that we have to use. Everyone, please say regulation. regulation. Ensure that your solution is actually working. This is overlooked. Sometimes you have to go back and fix something. You have to amend laws. Some people think the 13th Amendment is an example of that because it didn't end slavery, it just contained it to prisons. In Louisville, our fair housing laws were an example of that, banning racial discrimination, but maintaining discrimination that is parallel to race, such as discrimination against Section 8. So we ban discrimination against that too. And I mentioned the Crown Act earlier. Weeks after it was signed into law at a local high school, a cheerleading coach made all the black girls stay after practice and told them they had to straighten their hair. They could not wear their natural hair. They could not wear their braids. That coach is no longer employed. But the point is, the point is, we had to regulate, we had to watch, we had to monitor that legislation to make sure that the intent was being followed through. And if it is, if we go through this process, we use the last political tool, but only after you have gone through a process, only after you have done the work of education, communication, talking to your community about what's going on, collaboration, working with them on the solution, Delegation, who's doing what, advocation, agitation, negotiation. 
legislation, regulation, when you've done all this, I know Van told y'all not to do it, but I'm gonna say, if you've done the process, repeat after me, celebration. You reflect on how you address the problem. You pat yourselves on the back. And then you start all over again. We saw some of our fellow ADOS brethren and sisters having parades and brunches when Biden and Harris won the election. They celebrated without doing anything in our process. No politics, no black agenda, no political tools. But when you have a blueprint, when you have a black agenda, when you use political tools, you get political wins and you celebrate because acknowledging those wins motivates you to get more wins. And wins can be legislation getting passed. It can be showing up to this conference and learning something new. It could be having more people at the conference next year. It could be growing the outreach of your ADOS chapter. Those are wins, no matter how big or small. Nobody wants to constantly lose. Because when we lose, what we really lose is motivation. If we were a basketball team and we had a record of 0 and 82, most of y'all wouldn't come back next year. <laughs> Especially considering this work is draining and voluntary. You need those moments of victory because it helps you get back up in the morning. It helps you start all the way over to fight this fight again. It gives you hope. But even if you take an L, which is important because L for me stands for lesson. You need to go back through these tools. You need to practice, as Yvette Carnell told you to do, don't listen to Allen Iverson, you need to practice. And if you're feeling defeated, I want you to remember something else that Dr. King said in 1967 when he was talking to those kids. Help me read this. If you're feeling defeated, Dr. King said, if you can't fly, if you can't run, walk. if you can't walk, walk, but by all means, tomorrow, you are going to learn how to move yes. in all sorts of ways because there cannot be a movement without movement. Come on. You'll be in, in several trainings and workshops talking about how to use political tools, Advocacy with Keevan Kimball, organizing with Reverend Leo Woodbury, the racial wealth gap simulation with Metro United Way, how to start a chapter with Simeon, boots on the ground with Dee Gibson, state level advocacy with Dr. Faith Harris, power organizing with Bishop Dinks, or my workshop, where we are going to be using political tools in action. We'll look at an actual piece of legislation that I'm ready to introduce called Historically Black Neighborhoods Ordinance an effort to fight displacement of our people and figure out the best tools to pass it, not only here, but in your cities across this country. But before you step foot in one of those workshops tomorrow, I'm begging you, please do not be politically lazy. Do not restrict your work to a handful of tweets a day about politics. Do not take all of this knowledge and go home and do nothing with it. This is the second annual ADOS conference. Rise and organize. Or like, like this says, the building of a But you can't really build without tools. So before tomorrow, tomorrow, when you go to build, I want you to ask yourselves this question. I want you to answer this question. Read this question with me and think about it tonight as you all celebrate the city of Louisville. But read this question with me. What's in your political toolbox? And by the time this conference ends, it should be full. But more importantly, you will learn how to use every single tool. Thank you.